is a picture of the night sky. And this picture has tickled the fantasy, the imagination of the humankind since its inception. Questions like, where, do, where does the universe come from? Where does the sun come from? Where do we come from? Are kind of embedded in the humankind. So today I'll try to take you through a journey to space and time to try to understand how the universe form, and especially in its building blocks that are the galaxies. Galaxies are the bright spot in this picture. Galaxies are the bricks out of which the universe is made of. They are built by billions of stars and gas. And our own sun lives in our own galaxies, which is the Milky Way. So I'm a scientist, and I have to answer the question, how do galaxies form? How can I do that? Well, I have a very powerful tool, which is the scientific method. The scientific method tells me the following. If I have a theory, I should not start speculating about it like the ancient Greek philosophers did. I have to get my hands dirty and start to work out an experiment that can either falsify or prove my theory. If it goes well, I can keep going with my theory. If the experiment falsifies my theory, I should just throw it away. And this has been established by Galileo Galilei more than 500 years ago. Now, this is not an easy task for me because I work with galaxies. And we cannot create galaxies in a lab, right? It took the universe 13 billion years to make galaxies. I don't have that much time. So what I need to do is to find a cat, a way to create galaxies without actually creating galaxies. So the best thing to do is to create virtual galaxies. So my task is going to be to try to convince you how you can create galaxies in a computer. So how can we create our own galaxies? Well, this seems to be an extremely difficult task, but actually it's easier than what you think. Now, I'm going to try to convince you that creating a galaxy is the same thing as baking a cake, as strange as it could be. So think about that. If you want to bake a cake, what's the first thing you're going to look for? Well, you have to go into your kitchen and make sure you have the basic ingredients, right? If you have no flavor, no eggs, no milk, there's no way to go. So the first thing we have to do is try to figure it out what are the ingredients of a galaxy. So in a galaxy like this, we can see a lot of stars. Those are the bright points. And also a lot of gas. That's a diffuse medium out of which the stars initially form. But actually, since six, 60 to 70 years, we have made to realize that there is much more in galaxies. And actually, the real ingredients of galaxies are the following. A galaxy is made for almost 80% by something we don't see. This is matter that we know it's there, but we cannot see because it doesn't emit any light. Now, this is a very strange kind of matter. And the only thing we have learned so far is to give it a name. And we call it dark matter. Now, how is it possible that we know there is something if we cannot see it? So I'll try to come up with a couple of analogies to make, you, to make clear for you why we know it's there. Think about the Earth and the Sun. We know that the, the Earth is rotating around the Sun. And the Earth goes at 100,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, there are no speed limits, there are no cameras in the universe. How comes the Earth doesn't fly away? Or conversely, how comes the Earth is not captured by the Sun? Well, the reason is that the Earth has a velocity. So by going around, the Earth prevents to be captured by the Sun. Now, let's imagine we can grow the mass of the Sun. Let's make the Sun bigger. What would happen is that the Earth has to go faster in order not to be captured. Conversely, if we have a way to cut the hot sun in half or in a quarter, then there would be less mass in the sun and so the Earth can go slower around it. So the point is that the velocity at which the Earth goes around the sun is a measure of the mass of the sun. And we can apply exactly the same concept to galaxies. This has been done in the early 70s, and people study how fast the galaxies rotate. All galaxies do rotate. And then when people have realized that this velocity implies this huge amount of mass that we cannot see. But it must be there because the galaxies go in a given velocity. Again, this is very bizarre, so let me come up with another analogy. Have you ever seen a magician doing a trick? When they take a card, they make you sign it, they rip it in pieces, they burn it, they throw it away, and then suddenly the exact same card with your signature on top appears in the pocket of the guy next to you. If you've seen this kind of uh, tricks, you know that there must be a trick, right? We know that the law of physics don't allow us to destroy a piece of paper and magically reassemble it. We know magic does not exist, and that's why we know there should be a trick. 
But if I ask you where was the trick, when did it happen, which one was the trick, you cannot answer me. But you know there is a trick. As the same thing is for dark matter. I cannot tell you what dark matter is, but I know it's there. Why? Because I trust the law of physics. And the other interesting thing is that dark matter is the majority of my ingredients. In fact, if I want to cook one gram, 100 grams of galaxy, I need 80 grams of dark matter and only 20 grams of atoms. So the ingredients are bizarre, but we know them. So once, oh yeah, galaxies are like icebergs in some way. The part we see, which is in the top, the stars, it's only a tiny part of the total amount of mass that you have in a gas. It's like in an iceberg, where the part under the water level is much larger than the part that we see. So now we have the ingredients, and the next thing we need, which one is that? Well, if you are like me, I cannot bake a cake unless I have a recipe. So what's going to be our recipe in, uh, in our case? Well, the recipe is going to be the law of physics. Right? We know how to mix the ingredients. We know how gravity works, general relativity, very complex stuff, but we know how it works. So we have a way to mix our ingredients. Then the last thing we need, it's an oven to bake our galaxy. And the oven for me is going to be one of those massive supercomputers that we have here in the UAE and New York University and other places. So I'm going to put my ingredients. I'm going to tell the ingredients, you should behave as the law of physics tell you. I'm going to put everything into a computer. I'm going to cook my galaxy. But there's another thing that I need to know, and that's it's how do I set up my ingredients at the beginning? And actually, we have a way to answer this question, because we have a picture of the universe, which is the blue uh, ellipses I'm showing you, when the universe was only 400,000 years old. Well, this picture is very boring, right? This is just blue, nothing happens. And the reason is that the universe, when it was born, was extremely smooth. Now, the universe today is 13.7 billion years old. Those numbers are very hard to, to digest for non-experts, even for myself. So it's much easier if you rescale them to something more familiar. So let's suppose the universe is 80 years old. This picture I'm showing you here was taken when the universe was just one day old. Okay, so we have a picture of the universe when it was one day old. And as I say, the picture is very strange because the universe is very uniform. And that's very different from the universe we see today. So we see today, we see the universe is made of cluster of matter, light, the galaxies, and the rest is empty, it's dark. So how, how it happens that we go from something smooth to something very, very clustered? Well, the reason is that if I look more carefully to my picture, I can see there are indeed tiny differences. Those are the difference between the red and the blue dots. But how tiny is tiny in this case? Well, if I go to this picture and ask myself, uh, what's the difference between a region which is red, which is a little bit more matter, than a region which is blue? This is just one part in 10 to the 5. So this is, again, another very small number, 10 to the minus 5. That means 0, 0,000004 times and then a 1. And then what does it mean? Let's try to rescale it to something more familiar. Let's take this guy, LeBron James. And I ask yourself, what should I put in LeBron's hands in order to increase his mass by one part in 100,000? OK, LeBron James weighs about 130 kilos, Wikipedia told me. So what I put in his hands, what is that? This is an apple? It's a cat. I want to increase his mass by one part in 100,000. Well, it turns out it's just $1 bill. So the difference between red and blue, so regions with more mass and less mass in the universe, is just the same difference that you have between LeBron James and LeBron James holding a dollar bill. Okay, so it's very, very tiny number. Well, what happens is that this tiny number is enough. Because the LeBron James with a dollar in his hand is going to have a little bit more gravitational force than its surroundings, because he has the, the, extra, the extra dollar bill. That means it's going to be able to grab a little bit more matter than the surrounding. And so it's going to grow. Now he has maybe 10 bills in his hands. But these 10 bills allows it to be even more massive. So it's going to grab matter from much farther away. And it's going to keep growing. And now you see this is a runaway process. This is like a monster that the more it hits, the hungrier it gets. So what happens is that it's going to eat and eat and eat until it grows gigantic and it's able to create the universe as we see it now. So these tiny differences, LeBron James, winner without the dollar, it's enough to create the gigantic difference that we see today. 
So how different is the universe today? Well, if I check how much mass there is in a galaxy compared to the surroundings, a galaxy is one million times larger, more massive than its surroundings. So that means that from left to right, in our 80 years of life of the universe, these tiny differences MBA have been able to grow by 11 orders of magnitude. Again, 11 orders of magnitude, it means 100 and then nine zeros after it. It means that this thing is growing a lot. So let's take our initial dollar bill and ask ourselves, how much did it grow? So what does LeBron James hold in his hand now? He started with a dollar bill, and now what does it have? Well, it turns out, if you do the math, he has an Airbus A380 in his hands. Okay, that's how much the universe is growing. The universe is able to take a bill, and gravity is going to grow its mass so much that it becomes an airplane. Okay, so practically what we have now, we have our ingredients, we have our law of physics, we have our oven, and we can try to cook a galaxies because we know how to put things together. But please keep in mind that this is not an easy task because what we have practically is a picture of one day old baby, that's my daughter, and we're gonna try to see, to guess how we look at the age of 80, right? Have you ever seen those movies when there's the FBI detectives, they try to age a suspect to see how it's gonna look like? Well, our job is to age one year old baby, right? Nobody knows how it's gonna look at the age of 80. And remember that this little baby is growing. It's growing a lot, it's growing like a dollar transforming into an airplane. Okay, with this in mind, we can try to look how things work. So this is one of these virtual galaxies creation. You see at the beginning, everything is smooth. You see that everything is blue, everything is smooth, nothing is happening. And then suddenly, little cradles of formation of galaxies are happening. Those are our Lebron James with the dollar bill, which are growing. And now you see that the central object is collecting mass from all over the place. This is our monster, which is getting hungrier and hungrier. And now what's happening is that during this pool of matter, stars are forming, they're exploding, and they're pushing out the gas. That's why everything is turning into red, into hot. And now we have, this is the age of a universe. Now you see the time in the top left corner is telling you four giga years out of 13. So our universe here is in its 20s, 25. And now you see something is forming in the center. It does look like a galaxy. It's a rotating object. And you see it's still collecting a lot of matter. Now we're going to jump again. And now our universe is in its 60s. And you see that a nice object has formed in the center. So practically, we have been able to take these little differences that are in the initial universe when it was one day old and bring them into a galaxy. So how do we do? Well, we do pretty well. This is a real galaxy, and this is one of the galaxies we can simulate in the computer. And you see the resemblance, it's, it's, it's quite striking. We can get all the little details. But well, we can do more than that, because when we have a galaxy, we finally 3D model of the galaxy, right? Whatever we see in the sky is projected. And now what we can do with this model, we can take it, we can rotate it. We can start to zoom in and zoom out. And this is gonna tell us a lot about galaxy formation because finally we have a 3D model that we can go back and forward in space and back and forward in time. See now how the galaxy is thin. Another very interesting thing if you study galaxy formation is that you can also study the bricks of life. Why saying that? Because when the universe was created, there were only two elements. There were hydrogen and helium. Those are the simplest atom that uh, can be created. But we know that the life is based on something more complicated like oxygen and carbon. Now, while I'm talking, you are breathing. And while you're breathing, you're breathing oxygen. Well, what did this atom of oxygen were created? Well, they were all forged in stars. The air you're breathing right now, the oxygen you're breathing right now, it's stellar dust. What happened, that stars, they are now well dead, they took the hydrogen, they fused it together, and they made the oxygen. And the oxygen was then pushed out, as you saw in the movie, this red thing going out, when the star died, it was then captured by the sun, which then ended up on the Earth. So every atom in your body, every atom which is not hydrogen or helium, has been forged in a star. So we are indeed stellar dust. And that's something we can study because 
if I start the same movie I started to uh, show you before, what we can see now is the developing of this hydrogen, this oxygen and carbon during the uh, the age of the universe. So the beginning, the universe is blue. There's only hydrogen and helium, which is very boring for life. And now you see it's becoming colorful, and the color tells you how much oxygen, how much carbon, silicates anything you can think of. It's in the universe. And you see these elements are creating the stars, and then they're pushed away when the stars die. They explode like supernovae. And these metals are polluting our galaxy, and they're giving rise to the to what we call life. So without stars, there would be no life. So it's everything fine? Well, we can create amazing galaxies, but now it's time to go back to the ingredients. And that's what is the uh, current research in my field. The reason is that I told you there is dark matter. I know how much dark matter there is. But I want to be honest with you. We have no idea what dark matter is. After 70 years from its discovery, we are still back to square one. We have no idea what dark matter is. We have no idea how it works. We only know it's there. So believe it or not, we're trying to force the universe to tell us its tricks. But the universe has been much smarter than us, and we are still, as I say, at square one. And we haven't really understood the magic tricks that the universe has thrown us. Because, believe it or not, we don't live in this kind of universe. We live in a very dark universe. Thank you very much.